One of the reasons why it is important to manage hemp diseases is because they can kill hemp plants. But hemp diseases aren't the only reasons why hemp plants die. As you can see uh, in these two little pictures that I've brought in on this slide. Insects and on the right and uh, the way plants are grown or managed in the greenhouse as well as in the field on the left. And you want to be sure that you first identify what factors are killing plants before you take action. Species of the plant pathogenic fungus Fusarium are often cited as the cause of hemp plants dying. But other pathogens can also kill hemp plants. Sometimes multiple pathogens can kill hemp plants in the same field, even the same area of the field. Southern blight or sclerotium or Othelia rothsii is an, uh, also frequently called the reason why hemp plants die. Just because you see white fungal growth on an infected plant stem doesn't necessarily mean that southern blight is to blame. You need to see small, round, reddish-brown structures called sclerotia on the infected plant stem. And the smaller picture on the left with the red arrow pointing at the sclerotia shows an example of what you need to look for. These sclerotia can also be on the soil around that stem. And you need to see these sclerotia to be sure that the disease that's killing that plant is actually southern blight. You may also see fungal growth in the roots and the soil around the infected plant if southern blight is the culprit. And the picture on the right hand side of this slide uh, shows you an example of what to look for in that case. John Fike and I are collaborating with Dr. Alan Taylor, a scientist at Cornell University, to evaluate seed treatments for direct seeded hemp. Because many of the same fungi are involved in killing uh, seed or seedlings, as well as transplants once they go to the field, this research should help also help us identify the type of treatments that will help control hemp diseases that kill plants, regardless of how those plants are introduced to the field. This bar chart shows our results from the experiment in Blackstone this past spring. While none of the treatments in the experiment are yet legal for hemp, Two of the treatments, the ones with the red bars, appeared to perform better than the others. This may be some of the first research results showing that some treatments actually work for hemp disease control, at least partially. But notice that the best treatments in our trial still only improved plant stand from less than 15% to just over 20%. That's pretty miserable uh, stands, largely due to the conditions this last spring. We're also conducting a CBD hemp field study at the Southern Piedmont Center in Blackstone this year, in which we're looking at transplant water treatment and foliar fungicides for disease control. You can see here that so far we've seen basically no difference in plant stand resulting from adding double nickel and magistine to the transplant water. Likewise, we're comparing eight foliar fungicide treatments for hemp disease control. Each of these treatments has been applied to plots with and without a transplant water treatment. So far, none of these treatments have affected how many plants are living this far into the growing season. We are also rating hemp in this trial for vigor, which is basically plant size and apparent health on a scale of zero to five, where five is the best possible plant growth that you would expect for that particular day and zero would mean that all plants in a plot are dead. You can see here that again, while vigor seemed to be higher on the 11th of August compared to 16 July and 8 September, it was very similar regardless of what was or wasn't in the transplant water on the 29th of June when the experiment was established. And again, we basically saw no significant differences in plant vigor that can be associated with our foliar fungicide treatments. While you may notice some small differences among the treatments on each observation date, don't be fooled into thinking these are real. Each bar represents an average of 12 observations, and statistical analysis indicated, indicated quite strongly that none of these apparent small differences were reliable. While we're doing this work to identify products that will help improved hemp disease control, 
Knowing that none of our treatments work helps us focus on other potential treatments. So these results are really progress, even though they're not the type of progress that we would prefer. A quick brief note here that leaf spot pressure has seemed significantly lower in 2020 compared to 2019. We've seen very little disease, uh, leaf spot disease pressure in our uh, field test at Blackstone, for instance. We have seen more pressure here very lately, but so far leaf spots have been much more rare than in 2019, when lots of spots showed up soon after transplanting and just seemed to get worse and worse all season, although never causing defoliation that I know of. Hemp pathologists are currently thinking that these leaf spots may be ugly, but they may not cause any economic loss until they get so bad, so numerous, that leaves die and fall off the plant. And finally, if you choose to use something to prevent or control a hemp disease, be sure that you believe that it may benefit you more than it will cost you. Think about how best to apply the product, focusing the application on the parts of the plants where the pathogen or pest is likely to be, using spray volumes and pressures that will give you 100% coverage, and use the product rate listed on its label. Don't cut the rate. Remember that nothing labeled for hemp is systemic. All products need to be applied well before we know that they are needed. All must be applied frequently, usually at least weekly, and must be reapplied until we are very sure that they are no longer needed. If our application strategies are only half-hearted, you can be sure that only luck will give us a good result.